reading to us from the Psalms, and you're not going to have to stay very, you're not going to have to move very far from that, because if you've got your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Psalm 139 this morning. Psalm 139, as we continue in our series, Knowledge of the Holy, and uh, we're going to, we're going to wrap up our mini-series this morning from Psalm 139, as we consider this next attribute of God. But as you're turning there, I want to say uh, how encouraged and how challenged I was uh, last Sunday by uh, the message from Gary Semenina and how I, I was uh, so excited to be able to hear about the work of Village Missions and the work that, uh, that Gary and Patsy are involved in, in with Village Missions. And at the end of Gary's message last Sunday, he mentioned about a chart that, um, that was from Neil Anderson about who I am in Christ. And Gary had made a comment there that he wished the uh, overhead was working so that, uh, that you could see it. Um, so if you are interested in a copy of that chart, which I really would encourage you to because it's a great chart. Um, if you're interested in, in, in that copy of that chart, they are on the table that is just outside the sanctuary. And I really want to encourage you to take that home, put it somewhere where you're going to see it, and be reminded again of who we are in Jesus Christ, our identity in Christ. Because Gary spoke uh, from the words of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10 uh, to that very topic. And so again, if you're interested in that chart, that is there uh, for, uh, for you. But as we come to Psalm 139, verses 13 to 18 this morning, I want to, um, I want to say, I also want to say that I trust and pray that this series has been an encouragement, a challenge, and a time of being reminded and knowing once again who God is. And I am so thankful for the fact, again, the heartbeat of this series was the reminder again for us that if we wanted to know God, if we want to truly love God, we must truly know God. And as we, as we come to this message again this morning, I want to remind us of the, theme, of the theme verse of this series. As we say, as Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, he says, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and he knows me. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. And as I was was being reminded of these words again, um, as I prepared for this message, I thought to myself again, we boast about so many things in this day and age. We boast about the latest technology. We boast about the job that we have. We boast about the family that we belong to, and I'm so thankful to be able to do that this morning as I have my, my, brother sister, my, my brother James and my sister-in-law Trish here with us this morning, and we've been so blessed to have them here through this week. But we boast about the family we belong to. We boast about the things that we did this week. We boast about the knowledge that we have. But I wonder this morning, is the true boasting of our hearts, is the true desire and the true heartbeat of how we live, the hunger and the thirst after our God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, he says, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, was this Paul saying, well, I don't know anything else except Jesus? No, because we know that Paul was a very wise man. But, and don't miss this, this was the greatest knowledge and the most important knowledge of Paul's life. This was his magnificent obsession. And my question as we begin this morning is, is that true of you? Is that true of me? That the boasting of my heart is that I desire, I hunger, I seek after knowing Christ and Him crucified. And so as we begin this morning, why don't we pray as we begin our time around the Word. And so Father, again, I thank you so much for the fact that you have revealed yourself in your word. You have revealed yourself through your son. You have revealed yourself through the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I thank you for the fact that this morning we have the privilege of knowing you. God, the awesome and majestic and holy God has made himself known to his people. And Father, I pray as we consider these words, as we, can, as we move into this final section of Psalm 139 this morning, Lord, I, I ask and pray that it would be 
the cry of my heart, that it would be the cry of our hearts to know you and to make you known. Lord, may that be what we boast in above everything else. Lord, I thank you for all the blessings that you have given to us, but Lord, may we never forget that the greatest blessing that you have given to us is yourself. And so, Father, I pray that we would not boast in our wisdom, we would not boast in our strength or in our riches, but that our boasting would be that of Paul, where he said, for I desire to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so, Lord, I pray as we spend this time in your word, as we spend this time in Psalm 139, I pray once again that we would stand in awe of the great God that we serve. Lord, I thank you again for the privilege that it is to be able to open up your word. And God, we want to commit all these things to you, praying once again that you would give us ears and hearts that are ready to hear from you. Lord, I pray that you would help me to speak no more and no less than what you want me to. And God, we want to commit all these things to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray for your glory. Amen. And so as we conclude our mini-series through Psalm 139 this morning, we have examined what does it mean for God to be the omniscient God, the all-knowing God, from verses 1 to 6. We have considered what does it mean for God to be the omnipresent God, the ever-present God, from verses 7 to 12. But this morning we conclude by looking at verses 13 to 18 as we ask the question, what does it mean for God to be the omnipotent God? And yet what an amazing way that David reminds us that God is the all-powerful God. Look at these words and then we're going to break down this attribute for us in three different ways this morning. Verses 13, we pick up there. There David says, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they are more than the sand. I awake. And I am still with you. As we consider this next attribute, as we consider the omnipotent God, how do we see that in these words? Well, the word omnipotent is, again, two Latin words put together. The first part of this word, the word omni, as we've talked about over these couple of messages, means all. The second half of the word potent means power. And when we think of powerful, we think of strength. We think of might. And yet the word omnipotent means that God is able to do all of his holy will. Paul Washer puts it this way in his series, Knowledge of the Whole, or in the series, Knowing the Living God. He says, with regards to God, the word means that he can do all that he is determined to do, and no person or force can hinder him or oblige him to do the contrary. Why don't you think about that last part of it? He is determined to do what he is determined to do, and no person or force can hinder or oblige him to do the contrary. In 1997, James Cameron produced and and, and it came out his his probably one of his greatest movies of all time that showed and and gave the, the events that led up to the day of and including April 15th, 1912, the day the Titanic sunk. And in that movie, one of the main characters responding to the question as somebody looked at the ship that said, is this the ship that they call unsinkable? This is how the person responded. He said, it is unsinkable. God himself could not sink this ship. And yet on the late hours of April 14th and the early hours of April 15th, Titanic struck an iceberg off the east coast of Newfoundland. And as the ship's captain and as the ship's designer were chatting in the, in the cabin, Thomas Andrews, the ship's designer, said these words. From this moment, no matter what you do, Titanic will founder. And one of the ship's members, as they were listening to this conversation, responded by the, with these words. He said, but this ship can't sink. And Andrews replied, it's made of iron, sir. I assure you that it can And it is a mathematical certainty. And I want you to think about that line for just a second. As Andrews looks at Captain Smith 
in a terrified, with a terrified face, said, from this moment, no matter what you do, Titanic will founder. And as the tragedy of April 15th, 1912 took place, I was reminded again, no matter how much we think we can accomplish, no matter how much we do, there is a limit to our power. And yet the psalmist and scripture is going to remind us through this attribute, that there is nothing that God cannot do that he has determined that he will do. And as we begin this examination, I want us to see the importance of understanding that this attribute means that God can do all that he has determined he will do. For there are some things that God cannot do. Now I want you to stick with me for just a moment. In fact, the writer of Hebrews reminds us in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, when he says there, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. It is impossible for God to lie. We think about the words of James chapter 1 verse 13 that reminds us, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. It is impossible for God to be tempted with evil. Nor, as Paul Washer says, I love this line, he says, God cannot do the absurd. God cannot make square circles. He cannot make triangles with four corners. Nor can, rocks, can he make rocks so heavy that he can't move them. And what the omnipotence of God shows us is that anything that God has determined to do God will accomplish, and nothing will stand in his way. And so this morning, we want to see through various scriptures before we return to Psalm 139 that God's omnipotence is infinite, that God's omnipotence is incontestable, and that God's omnipotence is personal. And my prayer as we consider these thoughts is the words of verses 17 to 18. Look at them in Psalm 139 before we jump around. Look at these words. How precious to me. Are your thoughts, O God? How vast is the sum of them? If I were to count them, they were more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. I pray this morning that the precious that the thoughts of God would be precious to our hearts this morning as we consider point number one. And here's point number one. God's omnipotence is infinite. God's omnipotence is infinite. What we need to see as we grasp this first point is that we cannot, we cannot grasp the depth of what God can do. We are finite creatures trying to understand our God, trying to understand our infinite God with a finite mind, who is far beyond our comprehension. But thanks be to God, has revealed himself to us in his word. The word infinite means immeasurably great, means unlimited, means immeasurable in extent of space, duration of time. It means unbounded, And unlimited means boundless or endless. I think of the words of Jeremiah 32 verse 17 that says, Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. And as I I, I read those words, it was a song that kept popping into my head and I thought about it because every single time Tony and Carol's worship team used to lead us in this song, they led us in a song that was based on these words from Jeremiah 32. And here's how that song went. It went, Oh Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power. Oh Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thine outstretched arm. Nothing is impossible for thee. Nothing is impossible for thee. O great and mighty God, great in counsel and mighty indeed. Nothing is Nothing, absolutely nothing, nothing is impossible for thee. And as as we walk through these these words this morning, I pray that we would be reminded of that this morning. I pray that we are going to be struck with the awesomeness and the greatness of our God. You know, it was interesting as I was walking, as I was preparing for this message, I was walking through the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. And I was struck again by the words of Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. That we're reminded that the earth was without for, form or void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried that before, if you've ever tried to speak lights on. 
you know, and so just for fun, I did it. Well, I really did while I was sitting in my office all by myself. And nothing happened. Because there's a limit to my power. And yet God here, as the darkness covered the face of the earth, God spoke and said the words, let there be light. And there was. And as Jeremiah reminds us through the words that we've read from Jeremiah 32, there is nothing that is too difficult for God. Because by his eternal power, the world came into being. By God's outstretched arm, everything that we see was made. In fact, Romans chapter 1 verse 20 reminds us of that when Paul says, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. It was, not the mo- it was not the work of some moment in time when all of a sudden things went bang and this world came into being. No, the great and awesome power of the omnipotent God made the heavens and earth. And if Jeremiah, wants, Jeremiah continues to remind us of the greatness of our God when he goes down to verse 27 and he says, look at these words, Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am the Lord God, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? And as we read the words of Psalm 139, I hope we're seeing that again this morning. We're going to jump back to that as we see that the God of all flesh, He is the God of all flesh, is anything too hard for Him. See, we try to accomplish so many difficult tasks, and yet we pale in comparison to what God has done. But what I want us to see this morning is that there is not a single task that God has set out to do and looks at and goes... Oh, man, I'm, I need to rethink this one. Or he says, I'm not quite sure how to accomplish this one. Or even, what was I thinking when I said this? Because there's no way that I can accomplish this. See, Psalm, 131, Psalm 135, verse 5 and 6 reminds us, For I know that the Lord is great and, is our Lord, and that the Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and on earth, in the seas, And in all deeps. Do you know that the Lord is great? Do you know that your Lord is above all gods? Whatever the Lord wants to do, He is going to do. And I'm reminded again, that's why so many times we read throughout Scripture that people had faith in the promises of God. Why? Not because of the greatness of the promise, but because of the greatness of the promise maker character of God reminds us that there is no promise, there is no judgment, there is no word that God will not accomplish, that God will not fulfill. I was reminded of that as I read the words of Isaiah 55 again, Isaiah 55 verse 11. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty. I'm not sure what translation it is, but it shall not return to me void. I believe that's either the King James or the New King James Version. I love that. That's the way I grew up knowing it. It shall not return to me void. But it shall accomplish that which I purpose. And it shall succeed in the very thing for which I sent it. Rest in the promise. Rest in the hope that any word that comes from the mouth of God will be accomplished. It will not return to him void. And it will fulfill the purpose for which it was sent. Sometimes this means that we need to be obedient even when it doesn't make sense. Even when it may seem crazy to us. You know, I think about Abraham and Sarah. As we get to Genesis chapter 18, verse 13 to 14. The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Here's how she, look at the next phrase. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you. And about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was 90 years old, and she's being informed that she's going to become a mom. And she laughs because she's like, man, that's nuts. She's like, up beyond my age. And yet God reminds Abraham here, is anything too hard for the Lord? Maybe, Maybe this morning God's calling us to a task, to a conversation, to an act. And we're saying, this doesn't make sense. Maybe we're laughing. Let the word of the Lord remind us this morning that nothing is too hard for God. 
I love the story of the announcement of another child. But this child wasn't born to a woman who was too old. The story was born to a woman who was very young and who was engaged to be married and who was a virgin. And as the angel Gabriel told Mary that she was going to carry the Messiah, here was his message to her. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 36 and 37. And behold, and there it says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth is old in her, her, in, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, chi- with her who is called barren. But notice this last line. For nothing will be impossible with God. Mary's response before this, before Gabriel makes this statement is, how is this possible because I'm a virgin? And Gabriel reminds her that when God has a, has a plan, he will accomplish that plan and nothing is impossible for him. But notice Mary's response to this message. And I really do pray that this would be the response of my heart. This would be the response of our hearts as we read the word of God. For verse 38 says... Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. God's omnipotence is infinite. And there's nothing impossible for God to do. Maybe this morning we're looking at, we're thinking about somebody in our life who, who is yet to come to, to know Christ. And we're thinking to ourselves, man, I don't ever know, I don't know how God can bring this person. Be reminded this morning, nothing's impossible for God. And I think again... My prayer this week has been that our prayers would reflect the faith and the trust of Paul and the desire of his heart in the words of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, where Paul writes, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. But with that, we move to point number two, and here's point number two, is that not only is God's omnipotence infinite, But God's omnipotence is incontestable. As we come to point number two, we must see that there is no one like our God or can overcome God. At the very end of the book of Job, Job has finally gotten what he wished. He gets an audience with God. He finally gets to to ask God these questions. And yet in this conversation with God, God comes back to him and says, Who are you? Where were you when the foundations of this world were made? And Job understands, as God reminds Job of who God is and Job and who Job is, Job responds by saying these words. Look at Job chapter 42, verse 2 to 6. He says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak and I will question you and you will make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of your ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. See, Job realizes in this moment the greatness of God and the smallness of him. See, there is only one omnipotent being and he is God. I was fascinated with a line from the Stanford Encyclopedia's description of omnipotence, when it said these words. It says, omnipotence is that of maximal power, meaning that no being could exceed the overall power of the omnipotent being. No being can exceed that power, can exceed the overall power of the omnipotent one that we are worshiping this morning. And yet we see throughout history that people have tried. We have seen that people have tried to thwart the purposes of God. I think one of my favorite stories, I've shared with you before, but I love the story so much just because of what God does, is the story of the man named Voltaire, who lived in France, who was a pronounced atheist, and who announced to the world that within 100 years of his death, Christianity would be extinct and the word of God would be destroyed. And yet, as I love how God does this, and yet... Within 100 years of Voltaire's death, 
The house that he lived in for so many years was bought by the French Bible Society and produced the Word of God for many, many years out of that home. Nothing is too hard for God. And no one stands in the way of his plans. There is only one being who has maximal power. And no one is able to take that power from him. I want you to flip back with me again. We're going to stay in the psalm. But I want you to flip back to Psalm 115 with me for a second. This is one of my other favorite psalms. And we read, but Psalm 115. And I want to read the first 11 verses of Psalm 115. Love the pages of the Bible's turning. It's been so neat to hear that again this morning. Psalm 115, verse 1. Here's what the psalmist says. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold and their works of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have feet but do not feel, feet but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. And here's the driving point of this psalm. Look at verse 9. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord. And I trust and pray that there are ones in this room who fear the Lord. Trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. People today are still saying, where is this God? Our God is still in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. He does all things that he wants. And again, just because of the fact that our lives are not going the way that we want Maybe our lives are going through difficulties. Maybe we don't understand what God is doing. Doesn't mean that God has given up control. Does not mean that God has lost his power. We just don't see the bigger picture. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9 reminds us, For your, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as, high as, the, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Notice again, God's ways will not be hindered by man. Pharaoh couldn't do it through the slavery of the people of Israel. Goliath couldn't do them as he stood and he mocked them, but was taken down by a single stone from the hand of a shepherd boy. Nehemiah built the wall despite the opposition. Even Satan cannot stop the plans of God. No one was able to do it at the cross Because the cross was part of God's plan, as we're reminded in Acts chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, where Luke records this, Jesus delivered up according to the definitive plan and the foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. It was not possible for Christ to be held by it, because the omnipotent God raised him up through the power of the Holy Spirit, loosening the pangs of death. Friends, we take comfort in the fact that through the words of Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. No one can stop the church from being built. Not Satan, not the gates of hell, not the government, not persecution, not man. Why? Because the church is being built by the omnipotent God who cannot be stopped. Take comfort because there is one who is omnipotent. There is one who will never, ever be able to be overcome. And that's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, With man, all this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And so we see that God, the omnip, omnip, omnipotence of God is infinite. It's incontestable. But I want to end this morning by by helping us to see that it is incredibly personal. It's incredibly personal to him. I want us to see what the psalmist saw. And that was the all-powerful God is an incredibly personal God. 
Before we jump to Psalm 139, I want you to flip there. If you're not there, I want you to flip back there with me. But I want you to see the words of Isaiah 44, verse 24. When Isaiah says these words, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord, who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. Those words became incredibly impactful to, for me as I was preparing for this message because, again, as we were talking about the fact that God created all that we have seen, never ever forget that the one who created all of the world is the one who formed you in your mother's womb. And that's the point that the psalmist is making to us this morning. I want us to see that this God who has this much power loves you beyond comprehension and proved it in many different ways. This God who is holy, this God who is upright, this God who is righteous, who is transcendent, has come to dwell with the lowly and the contrite, and is involved in each life at the moment of conception, and even before so. Let me read the words again from our text, and I want to break them down. Verse 13, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. The power of God is seen in every life that is formed in the womb. You know, I had the privilege of seeing three more pictures of my sister's little one that is being formed as she just passed the 20-week mark. And I stood in awe again of the one, of the one who had the power to speak this entire world into being, is the one who has the power of knitting together this little one. With a heartbeat, with skin, with a little nose, with a chin, This is not the work of evolution. This is the work of an all-powerful, all-loving God who forms his image into every created person from the moment of conception. David recognizes that every life matters, whether in the womb or out of the womb. Because every life is a testimony to the fearful and wonderful work of the omnipotent God. And so this morning, I want you to look at your neighbor. It won't be for very long, so you can just like, just look at them. And I want you to see this morning. You don't have to say anything. I just want you to look at them. Okay, it's a little longer than I thought it was going to be. But I want you to look at them. And I want you to see they are a wonderful work of God. And that your heart would be pouring out with praise this morning. Not to the person who you're looking at, especially if they're your, or even if they're your spouse, not especially, even if they're your spouse. But rather your heart would be pouring out to the praise, in praise, to the one who created the world, who breathed life into that person that you are looking at right now. You see, Psalm 139 has become, Psalm 139 verses 13 to 16 has become so meaningful to me, especially in the last number of years as Don, as God called Don to, her, to the work at the Crisis Pregnancy Center in Portage. Why do I stand for the sanctity of life and pray that we would be a church that does so? Because David reminds us that every life from the moment of conception is a work of God and every life is a testimony to the greatness of God. Why do I oppose racism? Because every life matters. Because every life is a work of God and a testimony to the greatness of God, whether you are white, black, Asian, or any other type of human being. The image of God was created in every single person. Because he created them, male and female. Why do I believe that gender matters? Because the omnipotent God created male and female. The omnipotence of God shows the relational God in that he formed every single person who has been created in the womb and out of the womb. But not only is God's power personal in that he created us, I want us to see this morning that God's power 
is personal in the fact that he redeems his children. Again, we've already talked about the fact that God's definitive plan and his foreknowledge when he sent Christ into this world. But we need to see that it was done to destroy the work of Satan. It was done to destroy the work of sin. It was done to destroy the work of death and just bring his people from death to life. And so, so I'm, I'm so thankful as I was preparing for this message because I take, get to take you from one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament to take you to one of our, my favorite passages in the New Testament. And that is the words of Ephesians chapter 2. And I want you to flip there with me. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. Ephesians 2, 1 to 9. Paul says these words. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air that is the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You see, through these words, again, we see that God is not only, God's power is not in just the creation of us, but God's power brings us from death to life. And that is the omnipotent God who overcame sin, who overcame death by sending Jesus Christ into this world to live a perfect life. To take your sin and my sin upon his shoulders, to bear the judgment, to bear the wrath of God that you and I deserve to bear. To die. But then again, as Acts chapter 2 reminds us, the, pan, the, the pangs of death could not hold him. He rose again. And he's seated at the right hand of God, and he will return to claim his children for himself. All this overcoming the power of sin, overcoming the power of death, and giving us the opportunity to be moved from death to life. 1 John 3 8 reminds us. That whoever, keeps, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning since the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. There was only one. There was only one who could overcome the power of Satan. There was only one who could overcome the power of sin and the power of death. And Jesus Christ has come into this world to set his people free. The omnipotent God is personal in his work of setting his children free from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, from the power of sin and death. And thanks be to God, one day we are going to be set free from the presence of sin as we stand in his glory. As God's power is seen in his creation of us, even more than that, it is seen in his redemption of us. One commentator put it this way, all beings owe their existence to their creator. How much more the individual who knows that the Lord has formed him or her for a purpose. See, that's why Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is what? It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The power of the gospel is the salvation of those who believe that brings people from death to life. And if you are listening to this message and you have not embraced the gospel, then I pray today would be the day that God would reveal to you his saving power. That, you would, that he would open your heart and you would respond to the call that God has laid. To the power of God through the gospel that longs to bring you from death to life. Because understand this morning, it is the only thing that can. There is no life apart from Jesus Christ. And finally, we see that God's omnipotence is personal in the fact that he empowers his children to live lives of holiness. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. For there we read, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. To walk this holy life that we are being called to, the omnipotent God has sent us another helper that not only dwells with us, but he dwells in us to empower us in sanctification. Romans chapter 8, verse 12 and 13 says, So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you will put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And so as we consider the omnipotence of God, never ever forget that the power of God is not just about creating things or about flexing his muscles. The power of God is seen in the creation of humans, in the redemption of his children, and in the sanctification of the saints until the day that we stand in his very presence and we experience the glorification for all of eternity. And so as we close this morning, in his book, Knowledge of the Holy, A.W. Tozer prayed this prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we have heard you say, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be perfect. But unless you enable us by the exceeding greatness of your power, how can we, who are by nature weak and sinful, walk in a perfect way? Grant that we may learn to lay hold of the working of the mighty power which worked in Christ when you raised him from the dead and set him at the right hand in the heavenly places. And as we consider these words, I pray that they would be the cry of our hearts. That our desire, that God would enable us by the exceeding greatness of his power to live lives of holiness. And as we close this morning, and I invite Al and Merv and Tony to come up and lead us in this final song this morning as, as we're going to close with that song. I want you to bow with me as we pray the words of our benediction that we're reminded again that we are praying to a God who can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. And so to this, Father, we say, to you be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Forever and ever we pray. Amen.